Welcome to week seven of Virology, part one, how viruses work. I'm your professor, Vincent Racaniello, and this week we're going to be talking about how viruses with DNA genomes replicate their nucleic acids, DNA replication or DNA synthesis. And in this first session, let's look at some DNA basics to make sure we all understand the fundamentals of DNA and how it's replicated. We all have DNA as our genetic material, as you know, we meaning us humans. And here is a picture of the structure of a small piece of DNA. It's a structure devised by X-ray crystallography, and you can see uh, the individual molecules that make up the DNA. As you know, DNA is a helical molecule, and this is a double-stranded molecule of DNA shown in this picture. Uh, one strand is shown here. I'll trace it with a pointer. And the other strand is shown here. The two strands, the backbone of the DNA, is made up of a chain of ribose molecules. Those are sugars. We'll look at those in more detail in a moment. Each ribose is linked to the next one by a phosphodiesterbon. And then each ribose in turn is linked to a base. You can see that here at the top. And the bases finally hybridize with each other from each strand via the formation of hydrogen bonds. So let's look at that in a little more detail. This is, of course, a double-stranded DNA. We can unzip the two strands. We can denature it, as it's often called, and make single-stranded DNA. And then the enzymes that copy DNA, the DNA polymerases, can then read one of the single DNA strands, we'll call it the template strand, and make a complementary strand of DNA. And whenever there's a base present, the DNA polymerase will read it and say, I have to put in the complementary base on the other strand. So let's see how that works in some detail. Here's a different kind of representation of a double-stranded DNA. It's a flat representation. Here is one strand on the right and another on the left. And again, the backbone of DNA is made up of a series of covalently linked ribose molecules. Here's a ribose in the upper right. It's a five-carbon ring. It's a sugar molecule. And this is called deoxyribonucleic acid because the ribose has two hydroxyls in these positions. The ribose molecules are joined to each other by phosphodiester bonds, that is an oxygen-phosphorus-oxygen bond, and that forms the backbone. So here's one backbone. Here's the second backbone of this double-stranded DNA. Each ribose, in turn, is covalently attached to a base, which could be either adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. So here, for example, an adenine is linked to the ribose, here is a cytosine. Uh, here is a thymine. In a double-stranded DNA, there are pairing rules. Adenine only pairs with thymine, and guanine only pairs with cytosine. I shouldn't say only because there are some exceptions, but for the most part, that's the base pairing, AT and GC. And the base pairing is in the form of hydrogen bonds formed between specific atoms of each base, as you can see here by the dots. So this provides a mechanism for replicating the DNA. If we have a single strand of DNA with a chain of T and G and A and C, the DNA polymerase knows to make a strand with the complementary bases. If it finds a T, it will put in an A. If it finds an A, it will put in a T and so forth. Okay, so that's the basics of DNA chemistry, what we need to know uh, for this series of videos, that the backbone is a sugar backbone, the bases are linked to the sugars, and in turn the bases hybridize. Now, of course, it's the sequence of these bases that makes the genetic code, and the code is read in triplets, of course, and we'll talk more about that later in this course when we talk about translation. Today we want to talk about, or in this, this series of videos, I should say, we're going to talk about viruses with DNA genomes, and specifically how they replicate them. And here, again, is the famous Baltimore scheme, which I love so much. 
which organizes the seven different kinds of viral genome according to their pathway to messenger RNA, which, of course, all viruses have to make for translation by the cellular protein synthesis apparatus. Today, we're going to talk about viruses with single-stranded and double-stranded DNA genomes. And the single-stranded DNA genomes are shown here. And the example we will use is a parvovirus. It's a rather small icosahedral virus particle containing a single-stranded DNA genome. And if you remember from the Baltimore scheme, in order to make mRNA from a single-stranded template, you have to make it double-stranded. And then from the double-stranded DNA, uh, you make mRNA. So we'll talk about how the single-stranded DNA of parvovirus is replicated. We'll also talk about viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes, adenoviruses, herpes viruses, polyomaviruses, papillomaviruses, and poxviruses. They all have double-stranded DNA genomes of various configurations, either circular or linear or even hairpin, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how this DNA is duplicated to make more of it. Now, there's another virus with a quasi-double-stranded DNA genome that's shown here. This is the gap DNA of hepatitis B viruses. We won't be talking about that uh, today uh, because not a lot is known about the initial steps where this has to be repaired to make a fully double-stranded DNA template. Instead, we'll concentrate on single-stranded and double-stranded DNA-containing viruses. There are a number of universal rules of DNA replication that apply to all aspects of this synthesis, whether it be cellular or viral, and they're shown on this slide. And the first, which is illustrated by the uh, picture on the upper right here, is that DNA is synthesized by template-directed incorporation of deoxynucleoside monophosphates into the 3' hydroxyl of the DNA chain. Now, what does that mean? DNA is made by template-directed incorporation. So we have a template strand of DNA, and that's shown in black here on the illustration. And new bases are added by adding them to the 3' hydroxyl of the growing chain. And the base that's put in, of course, depends on what the base is in the template strand. So if the template base here is an A, the base that's incorporated will be a T. If it's a C, the base incorporated will be a G. So that's what we mean by template directed. And 3' hydroxyl is where the new bases are added. So the DNA that is synthesized is always synthesized in a 5 to 3' prime direction. And perhaps we should go back to a previous slide to explain what 5' prime and 3' prime means. We always indicate the directionality of DNA by that means, 5' prime and 3' prime ends. The 3' prime end is the end of DNA which has this hydroxyl. And that is the end to which new bases would be added in DNA synthesis. The 5' prime end is the, is the end with the phosphate by convention. So synthesis is always in a 5 to 3' prime direction, which makes sense because we're adding new bases to the 3' prime end of the growing chain. The template is read in a 3 to 5' prime direction, but the product is always made in a 5 to 3' prime direction. Those are things you just have to know, and if you do remember them, it'll make everything else easier for you. So DNA is always synthesized in a 5 to 3' prime direction via semi-conservative replication. And what that means is that we make two daughter strands. So we take a double-stranded DNA, we separate the two strands, and then each strand is copied once to make a daughter strand. And that is semi-conservative replication. We talked about conservative and semi-conservative replication when we talked about uh, RNA synthesis. Replication always initiates at very specific sites on the template, and these are called origins of replication. And we will talk a lot more about origins uh, this week. DNA synthesis is catalyzed by an enzyme called DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, and that's our acronym for it, DDDP. 
but it's not enough just to have a DNA polymerase. There are a lot of other proteins that are needed, as you will see, for DNA replication. We call those accessory proteins. And finally, the last rule of DNA replication, it is primer-dependent. Always a primer is needed. So in this illustration here in the upper right, you can see that DNA is being synthesized on a template. Again, the template is the black strand. The primer is shown here in red. You always need a primer of some sort to hybridize with the template and provide an anchor, if you will, for the DNA polymerase to start synthesizing bases. The polymerase will not work without a primer. Just very different from RNA polymerases, some of which don't need a primer, which we talked about previously. So here is a chemical look at how DNA synthesis occurs. And this is a slide that we saw before in the RNA synthesis week. And the reason of that is that it's the same mechanism chemically. Again, we've here on the upper left, we've shown the template primer combination that's directing the incorporation of new bases. As new bases are added, they are, of course, added depending on what the base is in the template strand. So if in this example shown here, we have a template strand running in the three to five prime direction. We've added a C. We have added an A, and you can see they're linked by a phosphodiester bond. And the next base to be added is a T. Okay, these are these five carbon rings here are the ribose, and the base is attached to it. So what we're doing when we're adding a new base, we're actually adding a deoxynucleoside monophosphate, and the riboses are being linked up. So the T, the nature of the base, directs which base is going to be put in. Uh, and then the riboses are linked up. Now the precursor is uh, actually a deoxynucleoside triphosphate, a DNTP. So here is the base, the sugar, and then we have one, two, three phosphates. What ends up in the growing chain is a single phosphate. So we lose two phosphates here. And the reaction that uh, accompanies that loss is shown here. It is a reaction where two critical amino acids of the polymerase, two aspartate residues, aspartate A and aspartate C, help to coordinate magnesium ions, shown here, and those in turn help to hold the uh, oxygens of the phosphates in the right place uh, to allow the nucleophilic attack of this oxygen on this phosphate and this phosphate on this oxygen, which eventually re results in the release of the two phosphates and the formation of this phosphodiester bond. Okay, so that is the two-metal catalysis mechanism of nucleic acid synthesis holds for both DNA and RNA. Why does a virus need a host for DNA synthesis? Well, they can't do it themselves. Even the biggest viruses with big genomes that encode lots of proteins still need the host for something. And whether it is the smallest DNA virus or the biggest in terms of genome size, DNA replication always requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein, and sometimes many of them. So the smallest virus, and you'll see, we'll talk about this, has to make at least one viral protein in order for DNA replication to occur. So the viral DNA, it's not enough for the viral DNA to get in the nucleus. It has to be transcribed to mRNA. The mRNA has to be translated, and then one of those proteins, at least one, participates in viral DNA synthesis. So simple viruses need more host proteins because their genomes are smaller. We call this genetic economy. If you have a small genome, you can't encode everything, so you depend more on the host. These small viruses need a lot of host proteins to replicate their DNA, and as you will see, some of them encode just one protein that is needed to participate in DNA replication. The more complex viruses, the bigger they get, they encode more and more of the proteins that are needed for DNA replication. Some of them encode, in fact, the DNA polymerase. But they don't encode all of the proteins that are needed. They all need some help from the host cell. And we'll look at some examples of that. How about the DNA polymerase itself? We'll keep it simple here. Where does that come from? Well, the small DNA viruses 
typically uh, do not encode a DNA polymerase. They encode proteins that manipulate or orchestrate the host to replicate their genomes. And these include the genomes of members of the papillomaviridae, polyomaviridae, and parvoviridae. And we'll give you some examples of those this week. So those viruses, some of them encode, encode just one protein that tricks the host into replicating the viral genome. These viruses do not encode a DNA polymerase. Many large viruses encode most of their own replication systems, including the DNA polymerase, and that includes the herpes viruses, adenoviruses, and uh, the pox viruses. And some examples of viral proteins that are encoded in viral genomes that participate in DNA replication, the DNA polymerase, of course, accessory proteins that are needed, Origin binding proteins, we'll talk about what they are in a moment. Helicases to unwind double-stranded DNA. When you want to replicate a double-stranded DNA, you have to unwind it to get the two strands separated. That, that enzyme that does that is called a helicase. Uh, there are exonucleases that chew away the ends of DNA for various purposes. And then all sorts of enzymes of nucleic acid metabolism that are involved in synthesis, for example, of the triphosphate precursors. Our genomes in our cells are all the same, not in sequence, of course, but in structure. They are double-stranded, linear DNA molecules. They're very long, and they're covered with protein, but they're all pretty much the same uh, topologically. But viruses are all very different, as you know. There are seven genome types in all, and a number of those are DNA genome types. So we have to consider how these different genome topologies are copied, and that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. And on this slide are examples of the different genome topologies that we'll talk about in terms of how they are replicated. And you can see we have the parvoviruses. These are viruses with single-stranded uh, DNA genomes shown here. They're relatively small. Uh, the herpes viruses are quite large, double-stranded linear DNA molecules. Adenoviruses are also double-stranded DNAs, linear molecules, a bit smaller than the herpes viruses. Uh, and then we have double-stranded DNAs that are in circles, the polyomaviruses and the papillomaviruses. And finally, the pox viruses, quite long double-stranded linear DNA molecules, but the ends are covalently linked to form a terminal loop. So this is unusual. The genome topology is very similar to, say, the adeno or the herpes viruses, but those have free 5' prime and 3' prime ends. The 5' prime and 3' prime ends of the pox virus DNA are covalently joined, so you have a loop. If you denatured this double-stranded DNA, you would get a single-stranded circle. Despite this diversity in topology, there are only two ways that DNA is synthesized. There are two general mechanisms, and these involve either a replication fork or strand displacement. Let's start with the replication fork on the left. Uh, here is a double-stranded DNA molecule, and on the right you can see the growing chains of DNA. Uh, shown in red or in pink on both strands. And again, the synthesis is in a 5 to 3 prime direction. So one strand is synthesized in one direction, 5 to 3 prime, but the other has to be synthesized in the opposite uh, physical direction, but it's still 5 to 3 prime uh, by nature of the templates. And this kind of DNA replication uh, causes what's known as a replication fork. Both strands are being replicated, and you get a fork that moves along the molecule. Uh, this replication is typ typical of papillomaviruses, polyomaviruses, herpes viruses, and, of course, the proviruses of retroviruses, and these are DNAs integrated into our host genome. So our host DNA, or I should say our DNA, uh, replicates by a replication fork. This kind of DNA synthesis requires RNA primers. And we'll talk about this in some detail in a moment. Uh, these are the green molecules shown here. Uh, an RNA is first synthesized, which acts as a primer for both strands of synthesis. And these are subsequently removed and filled in uh, with DNA. 
The other kind of DNA synthesis is strand displacement. Uh, and this is never primed with RNA. It does require a primer, of course. All DNA synthesis does. But there are different kinds of primers used here. And in this kind of, dis of a synthesis, we start with a double-stranded molecule. The DNA is denatured to separate the two strands at one end, as shown here. And then a primer-dependent synthesis occurs of a new strand that's shown in red. And only one strand is copied initially. And the synthesis of that strand displaces the other strand, as shown here. And that's why it's called strand displacement. This is typical of adenoviruses, parvoviruses, poxviruses, and... Uh, and that's it. Sorry. The primers, again, are not RNA. They can be protein or DNA hairpins. And we'll look at that as well. Now, the use of RNA primers... Uh, leaves us with a problem, and that is called the five prime end problem. So let's illustrate that here. Here we have a DNA template, and the first thing that's being done in this illustration is we're synthesizing the DNA polymerase is synthesizing short RNA primers on that template, and they're synthesized in a five to three prime direction. They then serve as primers for DNA synthesis, which subsequently occurs. That's the red molecule here. Finally, to make the full-length DNA copy, an enzyme removes the RNA. Another enzyme fills in the gaps, again, by adding nucleotides to the 3' prime end, the 3' prime hydroxyl of the previous piece of DNA. So these are all filled in. The gaps are filled. The ends are joined by an enzyme called a ligase. This is an enzyme that chemically joins 5 and 3' prime ends of neighboring um, riboses, and now you have a complete DNA copy, except here at the left end where we have a gap where we removed this RNA primer, but since there wasn't a 3' prime hydroxyl upstream, the polymerase couldn't copy it or, or add to it to fill in the gap. You can see that in this second RNA primer, when it's removed, DNA synthesis is primed by the upstream DNA fragment. But the, the ultimate uh, RNA primer on the left here, when removed, cannot be filled in. So we have a gap. And this is the five prime end problem. Now, our genomes have a five prime end problem, which is solved by having sequences at the ends of our chromosomes called telomeres. These are highly repeated sequences of DNA which are added by a special enzyme called telomerase. If we didn't have that, our chromosomes would get progressively shorter because this single-stranded area would be lost. And each round of replication, the DNA would get shorter and shorter until we would lose essential sequences and we wouldn't survive. So the telomerase is the solution to the 5 prime end problem in our cells. But viruses don't have telomerases. They have other solutions, and that's one thing we'll be talking about in this series of videos.